Hello, I am Arian Bamkonk, one of your learning fellows. Before I begin today, I wish to take a moment and offer you a content warning. Today, I will be speaking stories from the residential school and prisoner of war experience. I offer these stories as unique and personal connections to the themes of survival and thriving. I consider them necessary for the importance of understanding my message, and I do not use them lightly. Thank you. <sighs> Survival is a revolutionary act. This is born in the simple truth of the miracle of you being here at all. Think about it, the long line of your ancestors who came before you. Each generation had to survive long enough just for you to be the culmination of that creation. It is a miracle in the face of so many things, so many things. So with this in mind, I invite you to come with me on a journey. So wiggle in, ground your feet, stand up, whatever it is that you need to do to get comfortable and to listen. I invite you to do that. And I also invite you to listen only with the space you have available to listen to hard things. So come along on this journey with me. Close your eyes for a minute and I want you to get your imagination flowing, okay? Imagine you are a young boy. You live with a very large, very loving family. Your days are full of learning and experiences about what it takes to live the way that your family has lived for generations unknown, eons. You fish and you hunt, you wrestle, you fight and you play with your many brothers and sisters. When it is cold, you know what to do. When it gets warm, you work harder to prepare for when it is cold. You are taught respect for the things and people around you. You are shown, shown that you do not matter any more or any less than the fish you catch and the animals you hunt. You feel rich each night when you climb into bed with four of your brothers. You are happy. Now feel the day they come. Those who come to take you away. They rip you from what and who you know. To keep you from running home, they split you from your brothers and move you hundreds of miles. They even explain this to you, that you live too far to run away. And they promise punishment if you try. They tell you over and over and over again how wrong you are for being who and what you are. They, in painful detail, Explain how all you know is to be forgotten. How you must become like them. Even though they would not take you as an equal, no matter how well you act like them. You're confused. They cut your already mostly short hair even shorter. They take the furs you earned, dishonoring your hunt, and the spirit of you and the animal. They teach you about how the ways of all you know will end in fire forever, forever, and they call it hell. They speak of a spirit so big and hungry that it is meant to eat all you know, and that it rules with hate and fear and a lust for submission. This is your life for many years, and you are a believer. Then one day a miracle happens, a 
and they tell you that you get to visit your older brother, but it's only a visit. This visit becomes your next forever as your older brother takes you even more south. You have escaped, at least in body. There, that further south, you and the rest of your siblings slowly gather back together and you work to become a family again. Soon your mother and one of your fathers comes. Now think hard about what it would mean to become whole. You no longer fit in the way that you were and you no longer fit into the world that you are. Will you ever fully fit? You don't know what to believe. This story is absolutely true. It is the story of my grandfather. It is the journey he and his many siblings had when they were taken from their home and placed in different residential schools throughout Canada. They were spread out. He has never, he never did before he passed. He never spoke about this as a fully and complete story. Much of what we know is from his other siblings or the small nuggets, these little moments of prophetic witness, he would drop over time. It was only in his later years that he shared more. And even then, it was usually when we were in a boat, fishing on the river or fishing in the ocean. <laughs> and he would talk about how during these times he would focus on the family he wanted because one of the few things that he took away with him was the importance of family that was from the world before, the world during the residential school and the world after. He wanted to teach his family hunting, fishing, care of the land in the way that he was raised with it. But he was so scared that when he taught it to us, we couldn't call it religious growing up. We had to call it cultural. I don't think that he, in his 98 years, was ever fully at peace with the confusion in his theology. He was so afraid of hell. He spent most of his life very afraid, but he survived. And that was a revolutionary act. He's remembered for being successful in life in many ways. He's known for being a good dad and an even better grandfather. He passed along his theological issues to his children, cycle. But the revolution of his survival, it is only through the grace of the universe that I am here because he survived. That is proof to me that survival is a revolutionary act. But why are we stopping at survival? We need to strive to thriving. I'm tired of survival being the stopping point in the same way I'm tired of being told to be resilient. Yes, I have to be resilient. Yes, I have to survive. But why, why is that the goal? <laughs> Seriously, trust me, I scream into the universe with joy that I'm here and that the legacy of my family grow, grows bright. They didn't kill him. They didn't kill us as they tried. They didn't erase everything. Try. <laughs> I want a world where my grandfather didn't have to be in fear. And that allowed him to pat to, to like <sighs> that allowed him to be safe in whatever theology he needed to believe. I want more than survival. I want more for my own children. I want more for you and your children. We all deserve more. We do. And this matters. And, and now I have to ask, how is this done? How do we do this? When I consider the bridge from survival to thriving, I think of so many ways, intersections, layers, all the colors and shades. However, today, I want to offer a close look at some stories of some American prisoners of war. I look closer at these stories because they're stories of adults who went through trauma and survived and thrived. And I particularly want to look to the, 
the thriving part and why. Um, I also met a few of these people because I served in the military and they came to speak at events. So I have a personal connection with this. And the people's stories that I'm about to share want them to be shared as part of their own hope for thriving and healing and, may, and wish that it spreads to others. So these prisoners of war, these thriving, the ones who survived and then thrived, they, they have a few things in common. Um, all of them described hearing or dreaming about their families in a way that strongly encouraged them, even more than their faith, even more than like the voice of God kind of situation. They, they would dream about family that had been long dead and then would whisper to them. They would whisper, it'd be the whisper of their grandmother on a weekend, they stayed at grandma's house with the smell of grandma cooking. Um, in one case, it was the comforting hands, the POW described the comforting hands of his mother stroking his hair. And these small moments, these small memories of ancestor and family would sustain them for days, for months, and even up to years. In times when they faced in unimaginable loneliness, they felt not quite alone. And yes, yes, for, for my science-focused friends out there, my beloved, it might simply have been a survival instinct in the brain, chemicals. But as somebody who practices an active ancestor veneration, I like to believe they got the help they needed it, needed when they needed it. They got both the boost for survival and the boost for what it meant to cross the bridge into thriving. Now, the other things that one of the other things that they shared was a focus in their head on the future in a very real way. One POW from Viet the Vietnam era rather famously built a house inside his head. Now, I, I don't mean like he just pictured the house being built. I mean, he counted screws. He counted nails, tiles, carpet, paneling, wood, all of it down to the very minute detail. And the best part of the story, the thriving part for me, because that was the surviving part, is that he built the house when he came back to the United States. And ironically, it was only off by like six screws, two tiles, and one plank of wood. For that man, the house represented what it meant to thrive. And he worked toward that. In the dark, in the lonely, he used his brain to work it out. That was surviving. Then he used his body and skill to manifest it into reality. And that was his thriving. This very true story is about the house that still stands in Table Grove, Illinois. Very cool. Now these POWs, they knew that every day was a battle and they knew that they would backslide, backslide that they might reveal things or face things. And they worked every day to return fresh, to face it fresh every day. This happened in the POW camps and it happened when they came home. The folks who stayed in a place of thriving used their community to make it. They spoke freely about how they would get mental health care assistance before they slid back into a survival only mode. I think this rings true for modern traumatic events as well. And that's part of thriving, seeking help. In the case of the Hanoi Hilton POWs, they also spoke of the poetry they would tap on the walls in code. And it was a reminder that joy hides even in the darkest pain and that they were not alone. So, so let me ask you, with all of our knowledge and all of our modern ways, why can't we make one generation's thriving the next generation's survival? Where, where can we learn this? How can we put this into a sustainable practice? 
this dream of thriving for all. Maybe we start with this. If you're sitting there and you're in a place of thriving, like really thriving, or maybe thriving only one small area, then I ask, have you looked to your metaphoric right and your metaphoric left? Are those around you thriving? I try to do this and consider this as a spiritual practice. I know I can't fix problems for someone and that would be rude because they're on their own journey, but I can let them know that I am with them. I can let them know that a community cares about them. This crystalline honesty is so clear as to be glass for me. I also look to the old stories for wisdom of, for the wisdom of my ancestors. This is not limited to those of my cultural or genetic heritage, but my ancestors of thought or my ancestors of experience. I look to the people who ask the questions that I do. I then consider how they answered them. I let myself feel things and I don't shy away from them when they offer me discomfort. Looking away from discomfort is a tool of oppression and a survival mechanism. Survival is still a revolutionary act. If that's all you've got, it's okay. But to thrive, I look at what causes me discomfort. Then I take it apart, I deconstruct it because the parts are easier to handle. Why does this thing make me uncomfortable? What can I do to change the feeling? I'm a person who has to act to thrive. You might be different and that is the glory of the many rainbows of behavior. But getting to know how you handle this sort of thing is also part of thriving. So what does real community look like? Does the covenant offer us a guide to thriving? Yesterday, I shared stories of individuals, but those individuals impacted communities and were impacted by community. Family in the case of my grandfather and brothers in arms in the case of the POWs. We as humans need each other. We need a healthy, beloved community. How are you going to be part of that? How do you paint the world of the future with everyone thriving? What are the textures felt as time flows forward? Is it the mother's hands upon your hair? Is it the smell of the woods you hunted in as a child? This time, like many other times, is hard. We're tired. Are you listening to the voices of your ancestors? Are you realizing that many of the problems you could solve by the grace and the miracle of who you are? And remember, remember, if you are in a place of survival, surviving only, it's okay. Because survival will always be an act of revolution. Know you are loved and you are not alone. To close out today, I, I ask you to take a deep breath. And I want you to listen to a poem that started out its life giving community by being tapped out in a code on prison walls. This is a poem about what it means to fly away, what it means to be in the grace of freedom. It's called First Light Flight, and it's from the book, Taps on the Walls, Poems from the Hanoi Hilton, and it's by Ma retired Major General John Berlin. Hail golden talons, stir the eastern sky. Another fledgling day departs the hills. It takes the air as a thermalated falcon flies. 
cascading light as carefree first flight thrills. And who attends this noble soaring birth from the mountain crag to the gentle rolling plain? May they marvel from their vantage point on earth, yet miss so much not of the sky's domain. But I am not of the earth. At altitude, I am free. I greet the infant day with engine song. My contrails etched on an endless morning blue. And rare abandon urging me along. It's here, unfettered brother men in throng. To the first light flight, the one judged best of all. Thank you for listening. Hold you in love. Amen. Ashe. Be sure